the explanatory gap is not really a problem. It's everywhere. Let's take a tomato. How do you figure out what a tomato is except by dismantling it, by looking at it under an electron microscope, by doing all these things? That's how we find it out. There's no way to deduce characteristics of the tomato, what you get in the manifest image, the appearance of the tomato, from what you get in the physics of a tomato. But that doesn't mean they're not one and the same thing. Welcome everyone to today's AMA, where we're very pleased to welcome Professor John Hyatt. He is Professor of Philosophy at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Professor of Philosophy at Durham University, and Honorary Research Associate at Monash University. His philosophical work focuses on a range of topics in metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and epistemology. His books include, but are not limited to, Philosophy of Mind, A Contemporary Introduction, uh, the fourth edition of which was published in 2019, The Universe As We Find It, uh, from an ontological point of view, um, and he has numerous published articles and book sections. Uh, feel free to add anything to that, but uh, with that, welcome, uh, Professor Ha. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope I can answer at least some of your questions. Awesome. So, one thing I noticed when uh, looking at at the works that you've produced is that you focused a lot, um, a fair amount, on trying to understand the issues with the sort of manifest image and the and the quote unquote scientific image. And I think I take it you have a book coming out later this year called Appearance and Reality that that further explores some of those issues. Um, I guess just sort of as a as a start, what do you think is the most plausible uh, move in response to this? Not I take it that it's not to deny the, the truth of, of the claims we make in, um, in both the quote unquote manifest image or the, or the scientific one, but to somehow reconcile them or what is your preferred approach here? So that's right. Um, so the, if you, um, in discussing this and the book that's coming out, it's at some point this year, I'm not sure when, um, <clears throat> start off talking about Eddington's two tables. So Eddington, the physicist, says, um, as he's getting ready to um, write his Gifford lectures, I'm sitting down at my two tables. Uh, and he's, he goes on to say, yes, two tables. There's the everyday table, which he describes, and as you would uh, hit the table in your, that your computer is sitting on. Uh, and then there's the scientific table, the table that physics tells them is there, which is extremely different. Uh, and the question is, how are those two tables related? Um, there's the the um, the uh, everyday table, which I would say belongs to the manifest image, the world of appearances, and the scientific table, which is our best guess as to what's out there at any given time. But by the scientific table. Um, I take that just to be what you get in physics, um, which is, purports to be the science of everything that gets to the roots of what's out there. Um, now, one uh, standard approach, well, two historically prominent approaches are, first of all, to say, well, look, scientific image is what's genuine, that's reality. Manifest image, the appearances are just that, appearances. They're just the way things look to us and, and sound to us and feel to us and so on. They're, they're subjective. They're not, they don't really um, carry any weight. In ter if, you, if you're interested in discovering you know, what there is out there, really. Uh, so that's one approach. The opposite approach is scientific anti-realism to say, look, Physics isn't, and and by the way, uh, physicists line up on either side of this question. Uh, uh, the 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 sort of polar opposite approach to the first one, which says the appearances are just illusory, um, is the opposite. Namely, 
The scientific image is not meant to describe reality. Uh, physics is not, that's not what physics is trying to do. It, it just is in the business of constructing models, mathematical models that enable us to make our way around in the appearances. Um, and uh, it makes no pretenses to reality. Now, both of these uh, no pretense. There has no pretenses to describing the actual nature of reality. Both of these ways of thinking about this um, the relation, the manifest image bears to the scientific image, assume that they're in competition somehow. That one's got to be one's true, and then the other is somehow less true, or is uh, not really not. It, it doesn't. It has no pretense to, it has no, um, uh, it's not part of its remit to be true. Uh, and what I, my view, own view is, no, they're both true. The scientific image uh, tells us what it, what it is that the manifest image is an image of, so to speak. Um, that's mm -hmm. the short version. And you asked me for my preferred version, and that's it. There are various other versions out there, but I don't think they're very interesting. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way I tend to think about it is that, okay, obviously there can be some things we commit to in either image that aren't really real. But on the whole, um, why not think that these are just different ways of talking about the world? They're different ways of talking about the same things. I have a sort of description of... Uh, a quote unquote table in terms of um, sort of the everyday concepts that we use, perceptible qualities and so on. Um, but I can also describe that thing in, in the language of physics. It, it doesn't require that one of those descriptions are false or that they take priority over the other. Is this sort of uh, amenable to the approach you take? Uh, yes, that's, that's how I would think about it. It seems to me that it's not, this isn't uh, a dramatic uh, erring view. It just seems to me that it's the most plausible way of coming at this question. Um, right. And also, in I the, mean, once. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to bring up something slightly related about, about like levels of reality, but if you want to make another point about that. Um, uh, I was going to. Um, I was going to say something about um, the explanatory gap. Do your listeners know about the explanatory gap? I think so, most of them do um, when it comes to okay, to, uh, okay. Mind and... So this is goes back to Joe Levine in the eighties. Uh, you know, there's this big gap between um, what we know in neuroscience and you know the uh, the physical character of the brain and conscious experiences. There's this big gap, uh, and the, uh, this is, it's, it's an explanatory gap. You can't work out the nature of conscious experiences by looking at um, you know, physiology or even finer grain uh, uh, analyses of the brain. What I wanna say is that's one of the places uh, where a fundamental mistake was made that problem, the explanatory gap, is not really a problem. It's everywhere. Let's take a tomato, right? So you've got a tomato. It's red and you know has a certain heft and all these, um, as you, as you describe them, perceptible uh, qualities and so on. Try to work those was the evening star, uh, star. How did we discover that? Not by direct deriving ex uh, descriptions of one from the other, but by looking and seeing. How do you figure out what um, a tomato is, except by dismantling it, by looking at it under an electron microscope, by doing all these things? That's how we find it out. There's no way to deduce uh, the characteristics of the tomato, what you get in the manifest image, the appearance of the tomato, from what you get in the physics of a tomato, but that doesn't mean they're not one and the same thing. Um, th this is how I, um, uh, this is how I think about it. Yeah, my, my approach is 
I think more or less the same. A lot of people in who uh, prefer a sort of physicalism or identity theory will say, um, well, we have different concepts, right? And they're not, the fact that they co-refer is not some sort of analytic fact. We can't like analyze our concepts and, and determine that they refer to the same thing if they refer at all. But we can investigate the world and see what it is that they're referring to. And if it happens that, you know, uh, Hesperus and Phosphorus are referring to the same thing, then we can uh, know that there's some true identity claim there, a uh, statement that can be made there. And similarly for uh, tomato and some more precise physical description or, or um, mind and some neural description. Um, is that So is a phenomenal concept strategy something that you have um, sympathy for? Is that sort of what's going on in the background here? Well, I don't like to talk about um, phenomenal con uh, concepts and, you know, phenomenal characteristics and qualia, because I think that uh, cooks the books when you start doing that. Um, the, uh, uh, um, but uh, you, you actually made my point better than I made it, I think. Namely, that you, the um, identity is a relation that isn't, doesn't bring with it any sort of analytical um, connections between the things that, that, you know, we can use completely in uh, orthogonal ways of picking things out that turn out to pick out one and the same thing. I might just mention one small thing about identity, and it's this. It's, a, it's so, something that Charlie Martin, C.B. Martin, impressed on me a long time ago, and that was, that is, identity is a symmetrical relation. So if A is identical with B, B is identical with A. Uh, this is a point that Davidson actually makes in connection with the mental. He says, um, mental is the physical, but uh, they're just two different ways of describing the same thing, but it works the other way as well. The physical is the mental for Davidson. Uh, now, I'm not, this is not panpsychism. This is not to say that everything is, uh, uh, you know, can be picked up by mental description. But it's just a basic point about identity. Um, uh, I, I've been told that when Charlie Martin and JJC Smart, Jack Smart, were together at Adelaide, Charlie used to, uh, Jack used to flee from Charlie because <laughs> Charlie kept would keep reminding him that identity is symmetrical, and you know he, Smart had was defending the identity theory, and he took that to be. Uh, you know, reductive, to, you, you know, that shows that there really aren't any minds. And Charlie's point was, no, you, you aren't, you have, uh, you know, I agree with you, uh, Jack, but uh, that you're, to draw a purely materialistic conclusion from this is just a mistake. Yeah, I get that impression from some people that if you, if they think that well, if mine can just be identified with something physical, then that's the way this that's just like to say that everything's physical. There is no and there is no mind. It's, an, it's like it's like you're yeah, eliminating right. it. But of course that's getting it yeah. exactly wrong. We're, we're saying it is the physical. It's not, it can't yeah. be something that be eliminated. <laughs> that, um, that's right. Yes. Perfect. You put it very well. Right. Um do you so would, do you think some sort of identity theory is probably correct then, some, or some sort of type identity maybe? I, I don't. I'm. I don't defend type identity. the The problem is, I mean, you can't. Um, if you had type identity, you would have a much closer mapping between mental types and physical types, let's say. But we don't have that. They're orthogonal. So. Davidson, for example, isn't defending type identity. He doesn't think that every belief is a particular kind of brain state. He just thinks that whenever it's true of you, you have a belief. The truth maker for that truth is something, some physical state that, you, that you're that you in. Uh, and that could be different at different times. It could be different across different species or uh, different people and so on. So you don't get type identity uh, from these views. And Smart never held type identity too, by the way. I, he was a friend of mine and 
he would he would get very upset if people accused him of type identity. At the you know at the time he was writing philosophy, you can look at the history of philosophy and see where the wrong moves were made. At the type he was at the time he was defending um, Jack Smart, um, JJC Smart never uh, defended type identity. He wasn't thinking about it that way. He was writing at the time that David Armstrong was developing the kind of functionalism that Armstrong and David Lewis defend identifies mental states with functional states, particular states that play the ca right causal roles. That was how um, Armstrong was thinking about it. And that state could be different in di you know, different species or different individuals or the same individual at different times. The point was it just was the occupant of a functional role. The, uh, Functionalism as it developed did not accept that version of functionalism. Functionalism as it developed, so-called mainstream functionalism, functionalism of Ned Block and of Sidney Shoemaker and of the big functional powerhouses, um, was not the Armstrong Lewis, Jack Smart version of functionalism, but it was the um, it was the the view that um, mental states are not not the, the physical states that play the role, but to be in a mental state is to have the property of being, of having, of being in a state that plays the role. I, that, that probably doesn't make any sense to you, but it shouldn't really. I mean, to say that uh, mental properties are higher order properties, this is what people were saying, uh, is to say that you have the property of having a property okay, that plays the right role. And so now we get all the multiple realization stuff. So the property of having a property is not the same thing as having that property. That property, that low level property can vary, uh, but the higher level property remains the same. You know, So if, if I have the property of having a property that plays the right functional role, that lower level property might be different from yours or from a Martian's or whatever. But um, why think, why cast it that way? Why cast it that way? Um, exactly the same move was made when it came to um, dispositionality. So for example, Pryor, Pargetter and Jackson, um, good uh, Aussies, uh, Claim that a disposition was not, um, it could not be identified with a categorical property. It was the property of having a categorical property of a certain kind that played the right causal role. So that the disposition, dispositional properties don't do anything. Only the categorical properties did anything. And that just seems to me to be a, a deeply confused view about how things work and it comes from reading off the fact that we use the same term you know, belief or pain or whatever uh in cases in which what makes that term apply the truth maker for applications of that term can differ uh, widely across different species or different individuals and uh i mean these are just two examples of things that set philosophy back as far as i can see um, bad moves that people then blindly followed and still follow to this day. Philosophy is full of them. I completely agree. So on, on the functionalism there, one issue I think you've um, had with that is well, that these those higher level properties or you know the mental stuff that has them um, isn't the sort of thing that can play the kind of causal roles that we expect of them. It's, it's the lower level properties that are making the difference, right? Is this a criticism that that's, you've made? That's correct. Right. And the thought was the lower level ones couldn't be your being in pain because they're going to differ across species that are in pain. So the, the only thing that's common between the species is the property of having some property that plays the right role. Um, 
And then, of course, that property, which is that now being described as the pain property, it can't do anything. <laughs> the only thing that does anything is that lower level realizer property. But why not just say that's the pain? And it turns out that pains that to say that that A is in pain and B is in pain is not to say they're in exactly type type identical physical states. It's just to say that their their pains are physical states that play the right functional role. I mean, that's if you're a functionalist. And I think there's a lot functionalism has a lot going for it if you understand it correctly. Uh, so there is a, a a better way to understand it that doesn't that doesn't uh, have suffer from those issues or those right. So the, that seems to lead to uh, epiphenomenalism or something. You, yeah, Block wrote Ned Block wrote a paper in 1980 in which he talked about two kinds of functionalism, and the names he gave them were very confusing. But one of them was the Armstrong Lewis ver version, which he called the functional specifier version. And that the idea is that um, when uh, that uh, a functional specification picks out a particular state that's playing a, that's you know engaged and uh, you know is brought about by certain inputs and gives rises to certain outputs and so on. That was Armstrong and Lewis. So Armstrong and Lewis would say that's the pain. Let's say, but uh, the second view, which confusingly to me, at least, he called the functional state identity view was the view that um, it wasn't the function, it wasn't the state that was playing the role that's the pain. The pain is the property of having some such state. It's a higher, higher. It, they called it a higher order mm -hmm. property, which is also confusing. A higher level property, the property of having a property that plays the role. And that, so that kind of functionalism became dominant, became mainstream functionalism. And then we had endless stuff, uh, endless problems raised about mental causation, the higher level stuff can't cause things, and then people coming up with elaborate theories and really um, a lot of trees were um, sacrificed on the altar of <laughs> higher level properties in my judgment. Great. Um, so I think we'll move on to voice questions. We had one or a couple from Shinichi. If you want to unmute, you can ask your questions. Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, answering these questions. Um, I'll start off with just two. I have more, but I'll let other people ask questions. Uh, and I'll make one about kind of more serious abstract metaphysics, and then I'll ask a lighthearted one. Um, so you, I, I think, spend a good deal about talking about relations and sort of the mysterious or seemingly mysterious nature of them and how they often don't fit into uh, like typical categorizations of substance and property and so on. Um, and I think you settle on a view, um, at least in, in, in uh, one of your books, about uh, relations that um, we can actually, well, relations have uh, truth makers, they're true. Um, uh, but the truth makers aren't going to be relations themselves, and um, the way that works is that they're going to there's going to be this fact of the matter about them being intrinsic uh, relata and so on. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask, do you think there's any concern that um, someone might bring up that um, to cash out this sort of intrinsic, extrinsic notion is just going to require more relation talk, or do you think you can do it without appealing to anything like a relation? I think you can't get rid of relation talk. I mean, relation. we need to talk about relations in order to describe the world. The question is, what answers to that talk in the cosmos, right? So what is it out there that answers to that talk? I actually think F.H. Bradley got this right. You know, he said, um, okay, if you think relations are real, then they're entities, right? So when you have A and B standing in relation R, You've got three entities here, but then now we're going to have to put them before they can stand in that relation. They the before R can be related to A and B, we need another relation, and so on, and we get a a vicious regress. And um, if people, uh, uh, you know, one response to this is, oh well, relations are just different. 
you know, they're not, they're not like um, substances. Well, then the question is, what do you mean to, by saying that they are real? They're out there in addition to their relata, okay? If they're real and in their addition to their relata, they're, you know, they need to be related to the, the, their relata, and you've got, a, you've got a problem with the regress here. So I think that um, the Bradley is often accused of, whole, of claiming that all relations are internal relations, that is, relations founded in their relata. In fact, that was not Bradley's view. He never advocated that position, but that doesn't prevent people from ascribing it to him. If you actually read Bradley, he would think if there are internal relations, there, you have exactly the same problems with them. Rather, he wanted to say there are no relations. And I think he meant, he, he didn't mean that things don't appear to be related. He didn't mean that relations aren't um, out there in the manifest image. What he meant was relations aren't out there when you get to reality. They're not, they're not entities in reality. There aren't entities out there in addition to a right. So would you um, agree with a statement like uh, relations um, aren't really the kinds of things that are fundamental in our ontology or maybe not even there, but they're true and they can be translated into non-relational talk? So I wouldn't say I would. No, I don't think you can translate relational talk into non-relational talk any more than you can translate talk about the evening star into talk about the morning star, right? I mean, that's not, so the, the idea is that um, when, a rela when a relational uh, claim is true, when we look closely at the truth maker for it, uh, we can give a description of that truth maker that doesn't involve relational notions. That's not to say you can translate relational talk into non-relational talk. Right. Um, so uh, I, uh, that's how I'm thinking about it. I mean, part of it. Well, all right. Go ahead. Oh no, no, you can finish. Uh, no, no. I, uh, yeah, I prefer to move on to to, to your. You know, sure. if you have a follow up, that's fine. Yeah. No, yeah, I wanted to uh, make sort of that that point clear um, because uh, I was I was just you know a little bit confused. Um, and then also kind of related to this, you talk about how you have this view that like substances have to be simple. Um, and that's also something I wanted to uh, have a little bit of, uh, uh, you talk about a little bit if you could. So like, I guess where I was confused was if I have, like if we grant that there's a substance A that's a property bearer and uh, substance B similarly, um, if I take something like the muriological sum, assuming we grant that such a thing is possible, uh, is that sum going to be a substance on your view? Um, or, or, or by simple, do you mean something muriological or do you mean something else? I mean, muriologically simple, yes. Um, actually, I'm, uh, I've been in the new, um, the new things that I've been writing, I've been pushing more towards there only being one substance. Uh, they're just being, uh, uh, I, but I, in part because I think this comports better with physics than some kind of, than, you know, sort of classical atomism does. Um, and oh, I, do you mean in something my, like, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, a Spinoza. So I, right. on, in, in, on my view, this will shock, uh, I'm sure the listeners, but, um, if you, uh, uh, the modern incarnation of Spinoza is David Lewis. Uh, Lewis's, um, Lewis's um, metaphysics is the closest thing we have to Spinoza. Um, Do you mean uh, like the Humean supervenience talk is, is very similar? Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Think yeah, that about makes sense. that. Think, so, so for... I mean, with the Aristotle, if you think about two sort of fundamentally different approaches to cosmos, one of them is you could characterize without, um, you know, uh, calling on the the originators of these views, Aristotelian. The other one you could call Humean. 
Aristotelian conception is the cosmos consists of a bunch of individual things that are interacting all the time and their interactions are um, governed by laws and the law, what the laws are, are expressions of um, the powers that these individual things have. So they, they, individual things are empowered, electrons and um, protons and positrons and all those things have various powers and these um, you know, enable them to interact in various ways. They uh, issue in new states of the world and so on. That's the Aristotelian view. Um, they, the um, Humean view is there's no interaction. Nothing interacts with anything else. Um, and when you, when you think about Lewis, so Lewis says what you, and incidentally, yes, Lewis is, um, position comes directly from his teacher, D.C. Williams. I don't know if I've done, I don't know if anything I've published yet has the two passages, but there's a passage in D.C. Williams, who was Lewis's teacher at Harvard, that is, that is just human supervenience. It's, it's, it's right there. He doesn't use the term supervenience because uh, supervenience for Williams would have meant something totally different. But um, the idea is all you have is a mosaic of qualities in space time. That's it. They don't interact. They don't interact with one another. So this is the this is the mean picture. Now, if you've got these right, then uh, is the whole so you've got this human mosaic, these qualities distributed in space time. Um, is it contingent? Well, no, it just is, right? It is what it is. It, it couldn't have been otherwise, okay? It couldn't have been otherwise. If, if, it were, if it were otherwise, as Yogi Berra would say, it wouldn't be it, you know? So, um, uh, so now we have something that looks not like contingency, but like necessity here. And uh, this is how I read Spinoza. I mean, Spinoza's got a single substance. Well, okay, make that single substance space-time, okay? And that substance has various modes. Make those modes the qualities. They're qualities of space-time, let's say. And now we're there with Spinoza and C.C. Williams and Lewis. So I'm kind of curious. And I've, uh, sorry to interrupt. But I've, what just you... come to, I've just come to see that as the attractive option. Right. Uh, so what do you make of uh, like this connection? You're bringing up this connection of how they see modality, but presumably Lewis is going to affirm like famously like modal realism, but Spinoza, do you think Spinoza would end up agreeing with him on that? Or are they like, because I think like Lewis's counterfactual analysis uh, of these things and like of modality seems on the face of it different than Spinoza's. Right. So, so an Aristotelian can, well, is going to explicate, um, it's going to explain, you know, going to talk about counterfactuals in terms of power. So it's true that had I dropped this, vase, it would have shattered. Uh, that's true because of the powers in the vase and then the, you know, the floor or wherever I drop it and so on. Uh, so the Aristotelian has that kind of a story about a counterfactual. A human can't say that, okay? Think about you've got qualities distributed in space-time. That's it, okay? So a counterfactual is either going to be just absolutely false. Or it's going to be have to be analyzed in a particular way. What resources does a human have? The only resources that a human has is similarity. This situation situation in which um, I um, uh, the situation I'm thinking about uh, uh, if I were to drop the vase is similar to a situation other situations that I know of when people have dropped similar people have dropped similar things and they've shattered we've got we're appealing we're an analyzing uh, modal, modal talk away in terms of similarities, all right? Now, presumably, these similarities are objective. They're not, they're not, um, 
we don't just make them up. They're objective. Okay, so we have a kind of realism in the offing here. And I mean, that's this is how I'm understand. This is part. This is part of the way I understand Lewis's modal realism. I don't see it as. I mean, certainly Lewis explicitly denied that the other worlds were truth makers or modal claims for counterfactuals. He says explicitly they are not truth makers. The other worlds provide a frame of reference for the evaluation of counterfactuals. And what he meant by that was they, 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 um, they constitute a similarity space. Okay, And we, when we say, if I were to drop this, this vase, it would shatter, we're thinking about similar situations. And that's, um, uh, you know, that's how I think about Lewis's modal realism. I mean, there's there's a lot more to be said, but that that sort of gives you a, an inkling of how I've been thinking about it. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you. I'll, I have just one like a uh, very kind of lighthearted question. Uh, it, it's, it's good that you brought up David Lewis because I've noticed you have a lot of uh, um, respect for a lot of uh, Australian philosophers, so Armstrong, Smart, <laughs> and so on. And I, and famously, Lewis, I think, had the same kind of thing. So I, I wanted to ask, what is it about uh, these Australians that make them uh, such good philosophers in your view? So, you know, um, the uh, so Jack Smart uh, was uh, he would des describe himself as a Scot from a, a Glaswegian, uh, but he his you know his earliest one of his first jobs was in Australia and he stayed there until he died. And Charlie Martin, uh, his first job or one of it, I think his first job was at Adelaide with Jack. Jack hired him. Uh, and what these people and David Armstrong and um, uh, many others had in common was what they called ontological seriousness. And the, the idea uh, was centered on truth making. So if you, if you, if you wanna make a metaphysical claim then you owe us an account of what the truth makers might be, some story about what the truth makers might be, what they might look like. Uh, to make that claim plausible, and if there, if you can't offer such a story, I mean, there might be, there are lots of truths in my book that don't have truth makers, but you need to off, you need to offer a story as to why they, they don't have truth makers. When you think about the way metaphysics has been pursued in North America, it's tended to be loosey goosey, right? So, oh, you just pull one thing out and then another thing out and put them together as though you can come up with a metaphysical uh, view just by taking off the shelf components and bolting them together, or Lego bricks and sticking them together and coming up with some interesting thing. That's not how uh, the Australians see it working. I mean, they realize that if you're doing serious metaphysics, one thing leads to another. You can't just say, oh, well, in that case, I'll just be a Platonist about universals or something to solve some problem. No, I mean, it's, it has to fit together as a whole. And I think they, the Australians saw that. Um, uh, it was just, I, you know, I think it probably is an effect of their isolation. And the fact that they weren't, um, they didn't get, do the, take the Oxford line in the, in the 50s. They were pulling away from that. So Jack, you know, was uh, educated at Oxford, at Queens, and he, um, he, but he was a scientific realist, which would have horrified many of his uh, his tutors, I think. Um, and Charlie Martin was a student of John Wisdom, um, and Charlie was a realist from the from day one. So. Thank you. Oh, no, you're certainly welcome. You're very patient. All right, awesome. Thanks for that. I think you've had uh, your own criticisms of, of, of modality and certain modal claims. Is this, is this correct? What, what is the approach you would take now on um, like counterfactual statements and, 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 and modal claims like that? Um, 
Well, I, you know, I, again, I think that those kinds of claims come up in the manifest image. And I think, you know, the manifest image is, is essentially Aristotelian, the Aristotelian image we get. And so I would say that as long as we're dealing with situations in the manifest image, as long as we're talking about balls rolling and vases being dropped, then, um, you know, we wanted to say something about their powers and so on. But once we then, once we want to get behind those things and say, okay, so what's the reality that that um, makes these th these claims in the manifest image true, I think that's going to look like, you know, what I'm calling uh, Williams, Lewis, Spinoza, that, that sort of a view. That's how I'm look, thinking about it now. And at that point, you don't have, you know, there, you just, everything is there. That's it. I mean, there's no, everything is what it is, and it is what it is of necessity. Um, Right. I thought about this recently, by the way. I I was asked to write a paper on the mind of God, and I don't. I had ne never really thought about this, and, and I thought, okay, well, I I might write this paper, but um, let me sit down and see what I think about it. That's the only way I can function is to say, okay, I'm going to write out. I'm going to figure out what I think about this, and. Um, all these issues started coming up, and I realized, okay, um, there's something to be, there's a lot to be said here about uh, the relationship, you know, that the relationship that, you know, traditional um, theistic conceptions of God bear to this question about the um, manifest image and the, or the appearances and reality and so on. And, um, it's, it's nice when a, a issue like that, which is a side issue, kind of a, you know, it's a specific issue, issue in metaphysics, um, you can see that, it, that dealing with it, you can, that there are other things that are completely independent of it that give you a way of dealing with it. Um, that's not very good, but... <laughs> But that's yeah. you're getting an insight into how I, I think about things. So yeah, for, for sure. you. Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. Um, so user in the chat term, Chalmers had some more questions about philosophy of mind. So um, he's wondering what your thoughts are on on panpsychism and and proto panpsychism. Do you think either of these views are plausible? And um, and also, do you think that the combination problem or problems are uh, seriously undermine panpsychism. I, I know you have a paper uh, called Emergence in Panpsychism, where you discuss some of these issues, but maybe you could talk some more. Yeah, so um, I've been to some panpsychism workshops and conferences and so on. Uh, and Galen Strassen and I correspond a lot uh, and read each other's things. He's got a um, new book in the works that I've looked in parts of. Uh, at least I assume it's in the works. Um, uh, and I think I, that that he's so I t earlier so panpsychism takes starts with the hard problem. Right, so we've got the hard problem here, the explanatory gap. If you say, if you recognize that gap, there are hard problems everywhere. There's a hard problem, if you want to call it that, in figuring out why tomatoes have the character characteristics they have, given uh, you know a particle level story and so on. So. Now, um, what we don't want to, what we would not want to do in the case of the tomato is say, well, look, you know, you can't get, there's, I cannot see how it's possible to get redness, let's say, out of colorless particles by putting colorless particles together. So we're going to have to put redness right down there at the fundamental level. And um, to me, that's just, that's, that's the mistake of 
thinking, well, it's the, the mistake that everything I've been saying today is trying to expose as a mistake. That's the mistake. So that's why I don't like panpsychism. I don't think we need to have, I don't think we need to have phenomenal properties, whatever they are. They're just, we all know what they are, what, you know, but do we? I mean, what are, what are the properties of your experiences? Right, you know, so when people describe their properties of their experiences, they typically describe the things they're experiencing, uh, and then philosophers come along and talk about phenomenal red. So the redness is not in the tomato; it's in me. And now we have multiple mysteries. But to me, panpsychism mistake does that mistakes. The hard problem is the problem pertaining to consciousness. The hard problem, if you want to call it that. Is everywhere. It's you know getting from the the particles to the tomato. Now, um, I might point out to fans of panpsychism that might be listening that Keith Campbell and um, his nineteen ninety book, which I think should be required reading for anyone who does metaphysics. Uh, and the, I, I owned it for years before I read it because of the title was so off-putting to me. It's called Abstract Particulars, and he published it in 1990. And he says, look, you know, uh, he takes conscious, consciousness very seriously, and he thinks that one possibility would be that consciousness is just one of the fields, okay? So we have a unified, smooth, continuous thing that's consciousness. And um, when we have individual conscious agents and we have, you know, concentrations of local concentrations of energy or something in this field, just as when you might think that there's a mass field and when we have a massy particle, what we have is a a local concentration of energy in this continuous field. So I'm not I'm not rec I, I'm not endorsing this part of um, of uh, Campbell's book, but I just the his, as a his, as a matter of historical record, I like to say if you're a panpsychist and you're attracted to kind of global view, then Keith Campbell had it a long time ago. Right. Then that. Something you mentioned there briefly in, in your in your answer was that look, some people when they are asked to describe their, their mental states, they'll supply descriptions of the things that their mental states are of, right? They'll, you know, if they have a visual experience of a a red tomato, then they'll, they'll start describing their visual experience as something red or round. <laughs> and that's I, I believe that's what you you two place called the phenomenological fallacy, right? Um, that's why right. I think that's that right. the, the mental state has the properties um, of the things the mental state is of or, or that you're perceiving. Um, and maybe it turns out that the uh, particular mental state has the properties of brains or something like that, right? That's right. Yes. Exactly right. I mean, that's, that's right. It's, it's, um, as far as a depiction of my position, yes. Right, of course. <laughs> Not everyone's going to agree. Of course, Place uh, wrote, was writing that, and uh, Place ended up in uh, Australia when the um, when um, Adelaide University decided they would add uh, psychology. Psychology wasn't thought of as a legitimate discipline in those times, at least not in Adelaide. And they uh, added psychology to philosophy. So smart hired place. And there uh, he came and um, he and uh, Jack and Charlie Martin, you know, all knew each other and argued with each other all the time. Um, Place when he died, I don't know if you know this, he left his brain to uh, Adelaide University. And if you go to if you go to um, South Australia and go to Adelaide, you can go to the university and see Place's brain. It's in a 
it's, a, yeah. it's preserved in a container with a sign that says, is UT places consciousness in here with an arrow <laughs> pointing to the brain. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, Charming Thomas had a couple other questions about mm, philosophy of mind. I guess he was wondering what, what you thought of uh, property dualism um, as a view in the philosophy of mind. It's because for me, it's been sort of a hard view to really understand um, and, and distinguish it from, from other sorts of views that are, that I can make more sense of. So I was wondering what, He's, I guess he was wondering what you think of the view. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think um, that there is a special class of mental properties. I mean, to me, um, mental and physical are different, different ways of thinking about, uh, you know, on a particular occasion, the, the same thing. They're different perspectives on the same thing. The mental physical distinction or the distinction between a mental property and a physical property is a distinction the um the scholastics and the um early moderns people like descartes uh, called these distinctions of reason to reason and that was you can make a distinction it's like a conceptual distinction even though there's not a real distinction there, there's you're there are just two different ways of coming at one and the same thing. And I think talk about mental properties is that sort of thing that the 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 um, mental ways we have of describing things are one way of describing things that could be given physical description. And again, not everything, just like not everything is red, is red, for example, not everything is mental. Certain things answer to mental predicates, and um, those things, what whatever it is in virtue of which they answer to those predicates, could be given a, a purely physical description, a, a completely different kind of description. Fair enough. So we had another question uh, in the text chat here from Kalisti, who was wondering. So he says, you hold to a kind of truth maker principle. At the same time, correct me if I'm wrong, you are a nominalist and don't believe in abstract objects. Does this mean that you reject, reject truth maker maximalism for max mathematical and modal truths? If so, why isn't limiting truth makers to ordinary empirical truths arbitrary? And if not, what kind of truth makers could there be for these truths? So that's a great question. Uh, I go with um, on mathematics and logic and things like that, I don't think that mathematical truths and logical truths require truth makers. And the reason Ross Cameron puts it, uh, and Augustine does as well, Augustine Rail, not not Saint Augustine, right, right. Um, um, uh, puts it this way: mathematics requires nothing. Of the cosmos, Math uh, mathematics doesn't constrain the cosmos in any way. Uh, it does in in the way that, say, Newtonian physics constrains the way things are are going to be. So, mathematical truths, um, I think Rayo might call it call this trivialism. I'm not sure. It's been several years since I've been reading up on this stuff, but that's the that's the view that I take. Um, and again, I think modal truths, um, the first, modal truths belong in the manifest image. They belong in the worlds of appearances, the Aristotelian world, and the truth makers for those modal truths about the universe, about ways the universe is, are um, you know powers that things have. Things are invested with powers, and in virtue of that, various modal truths hold of them. But again the the end of the day the story about the truth makers for those things could turn out to be you know uh lewis williams lewis spinoza view that strikes me uh now as closer to what we what we're the ways in which we're moving in physics and 
does the Aristotelian view. I mean, the Aristotelian view is great for Newtonians and great for Newton and Galileo, but for once we start talking about entangled systems of particle of um, particles and so on, then the you know efficient causation doesn't seem to take hold. Efficient causation seems to belong to the manifest image, and all of this is stuff that is. I, I think probably radically different from things that I've said in earlier things I've written. I mean, what I, I underwent kind of a, um, oh, I don't know. I had a, I, I had what I call a revelation. And of course, you can't put much stock in revelations, but I suddenly thing, I started seeing things quite differently than I had been seeing them before. Uh, so all of this is kind of, might be surprising to some of you who've read some of my other earlier things. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually wanted to switch gears slightly and ask a uh, somewhat unrelated question. Uh, so you have a paper called Natural Intentionality, where you explore some interesting issues. One thing that you discuss is uh, Kripke's or the Kripke-Stein rule following argument. And uh, I take it that your response is something like this, that look, um, we do have the dispositions to follow these rules. It's just that in some cases, um, and because of our various limitations and frailty and so forth, uh, these dispositions aren't realized. Is this, um, is this something, is this what you would, Agree to is this uh, what you're, the point that you're trying to make there? Boy, I haven't I haven't thought about this in ages, Troy. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, the um, I mean the what probably at that time uh, I was more or less articulating the kind of position that Charlie Martin and I were arguing about. By then he was a he was at Alberta. He was in uh, at uh, Calgary, um, and the idea was: look, you you know, you want to you. How do we get sort of projectivity? How do you get things projecting out onto the world? Right. So when we talk about the world, our, we're talking, and you know, that's a physical thing going on here. But we're our words refer to things outside us. And Charlie's view was, we we have dispositionality, so we have dispositions of various sorts, and we can build on those dispositions to come up with an explanation of how intentionality works. And it's kind of an inside-out uh, model of intentionality. I don't think I could reconstruct <laughs> in any uh, detail how exactly I was thinking this would work out. I mean. Charlie's view was that mental imagery was huge, that mental imagery, um, uh, we use mental imagery to think about things and that language was just an extension of that, uh, our ability or use of imagery to relate ourselves to the, to the world. So we, we would use imagery in the course of interacting with things. Um, uh, but you know, all right, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't remember the, um, things about rule following. I guess I was thinking that rules were tracking dispositions. Um, yeah, yeah, no worries. I mean, this was from the early 2000s, I think, 2004, yeah. the paper was, um, yeah. I don't expect you to remember everything you've written because you've, of course, written a lot, oh. uh, <laughs> but yeah, I guess just the concern might be, or a concern might be that if we think that um, the following of a rule is, especially a rule like addition is just tracking or just depends on the sort of dispositions we have. Um, well, and in those, in this, there's gonna be cases where uh, because of the way we are, this disposition is never realized. Um, there, there's gonna, definitely going to be an epistemic 
concern and may still be a sort of ontological one in that why I think we have this disposition um, or what makes it the case that we have this disposition, say, to follow the addition rule um, rather than another disposition, which for all we know, and it may just be the case that it's consistent with um, all everything we've done so far and our, our internal makeup and so forth. Do, do you kind of understand the right. concern? Yeah, so, okay, so I'm vaguely remembering this now. So the idea, I mean, I think Charlie's view was that there would be a fact of the matter, whether we could know it or not. There's a fact of the matter of, of whether you're you're um, following the addition or the what was it quadition rule, uh, and right. you know there, uh, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this it was built into this disposition that it would, you know, content, build on itself in a particular way. Uh, Knowing how, knowing that it would do that, that's that's just another matter. But nevertheless, it could be a fact of the matter. There could be, could be a fact here, or you know, the right in the disposition. I mean, think about um, disposition. Could something have a disposition to manifest itself in concert with something that that has never existed? Right. Well. Um, why not? I mean, if the if, suppose you have um, two kinds of particles, A particles and B particles, and they're in um, uh, opposite, they're in different light cones, so they they could never come together. But it could still be true that if they came together, it could be built into them. That if they came together, they would man that there would be a manifestation of a particular kind, and I think. Um, that's just, you know, that's just part of their nature. If you didn't think that, and if you then if you thought that somehow you needed the the things actually to be there, that would be very odd because if you if you took if somehow one of these particles that are in opposite light light cones suddenly came into the like the the two particles came into the same light cone suddenly boom it would acquire new disposition but that doesn't doesn't make you know why think that why not just think they had these dispositions all the time but epistemologically we're not we're in no position to identify them or describe them in any detail yeah um i still i, I still think there there's room to to push back there i mean one issue would still be that the epistemic concern might be still worrying on its own, but presumably, in the, in the case of the particle, there's, I mean, there is some fact of the matter about sort of how it's constructed, the sort of intrinsic properties that it has that we can talk about those mm -hmm. dispositions. But um, is that the same thing we'll find in, in an intentional agent? Um, uh, it seems that all the stuff internal to them is consistent with them having the other sort of disposition, uh, the, the disposition to follow the quadition rule or something like that. Um, I mean, maybe maybe it's just not clear to me how this this makes a lot of progress in solving this year. So oh, I mean, I think it's the particle example is strictly analogous to this example um, because mm -hmm. we're in no position say that the a, an a particle would you know together with a b put together with a b particle would meant that you would get a certain kind of manifestation we're in no position to say that from our point from given what we know and given the fact that the we haven't put the particle the particles haven't come together uh, we can't say for all we know they could manifest themselves in any number of different ways um and I think it's exactly the exactly the same thing holds the, the as I say, I, to my mind, the cases are strictly analogous to one another, the particle case and a rule following case. I'm glad you reminded me of this, Troy. So. Yeah, no worries. All right. And, and I guess on a related uh, topic, what do you think of the 
um, of normativity and the, the normativity of our mental states. Um, is this something worth taking seriously? Is this, or is this something that just comes up in the in the manifest image? I guess if you could comment on that briefly. Um, so you mean uh, that they can be true and false? I mean, I'm not. I'm. Uh, well, thing you get in Davidson, or I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure what exactly you have in mind. Yeah. So I guess when I'm talking about um, normativity, uh, that there's. That we have reasons to do things that we have certain um oughts and so forth that there's a a, a standard that we should mm -hmm. um adhere to um and can fail to do so um I, I don't think true or false is that sort of thing um i mean we might have some there may be some obligation or or uh, norm to believe true things but you know something's being true or, or a belief being true isn't itself normative um in this sense right, right so that so that's why i mentioned davidson so right so um notice that what david notice what david's the way davidson um spells this out so you know it you've uh, everything has to fit together right so your um your reasons have to uh your reasons for uh, forming a particular intention let's say have to bear on that intention and so on. But then we get the causal stuff in there, right? So reasons are causes, which at the time when Davidson was writing was highly controversial. I mean, so Davidson was writing against the Oxford background in which people's reasons were just sort of to contextualize their actions and so on. There wasn't any thought that reasons could be causes. But the what Davidson is going to say would say is the only way reasons can be causes is if those reasons um, are you know the truth makers for ascriptions of those reasons can be given a physical description that has not, no normativity in it at all and there's a causal relation to you know whatever gets your body moving in a particular way when you're when you let's say form the intent you, you have you you feel um, feel stuffy, you uh, form the belief that it's stuffy, you form the desire to do something about it, you form the desire to open the window, and uh, uh, then you have an, you, in, you intend to open the window by walking across the room and you do so. So that all of that can be described in this um, normative way, but the mechanisms, uh, the truth makers for all of that are going to turn out to be susceptible to a completely orthogonal physical description. No, you know, no, it, there's no expectation that you could actually come up with this, but that there is a physical description. That description would contain no normative components in it. Um, that, again, that's not to that's not to brush aside normativity. I mean, it's perfectly real. It's just that this is what, you know, this is what it is for a reason to rationalize an action. You know, the Davidson used rationalize, rationalize to mean make rational. Um, is, you know, the truth maker for that on a particular occasion could be this completely non-normative sequence of events. Um, I think actually that's very, probably pretty close to what my view is on these things. Um, Again, it's just another sort of language for talking about our, our mental lives, but our mental lives might be tribal in non order of language as well. I don't um, see any in-principle issue with that. So on the rule following stuff, the user Dogger was wondering, do you think that we could just deny that meaning is something that's normative and, and, and that there's no, um, I'm not sure exactly what he's getting here. There's no correct way to refer to a rule. Um, there's just a, a matter of fact about what people consider to be addition based on some mental states. I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at here, but um, I, I know that some have criticized um, Kripke by uh, assuming that meaning is, is normative in some significant way when we need not make that sort of assumption. Um, 
maybe do you have any any thoughts on the normativity of meaning itself? Uh, oh no, I, I mean, I again, I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, I, if I were thinking of it as a normative way, I would be thinking with Davidson. I think, um, but again, uh, the truth makers for um, those normative truths could turn out to be non-normative, you know, features of the cosmos. And in fact, I I really don't see how it could be. I'm at the point where I don't see how it could be otherwise. I mean, the the um, one of the things that Galen says in this uh, book that I think he's working on is he. Um, he comes out against uh, the philosophical tendency to divide things up, find dichotomies when in fact what we should be looking for are unities. And I think the normative, non-normative uh, appearance, reality, manifest scientific image, uh, mental, physical, all of these are, you know, I, I would say are examples of cases in which We've got concept what you might call conceptual distinctions or uh, something like that, uh, and not real distinctions. You have distinctions of reason to reason, as Descartes would say, but not real distinctions. And that we what we need to understand is how they fit together, why they aren't real distinctions. Um, uh, so uh, and, and 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 this in no way, uh, demeans normativity or meaning or you know ethics or anything like that. The, the point is that you're asking for trouble or and free will. Take free will. Um, you know uh, uh, the idea that you know if well you know if we've got the four dimensional deterministic universe uh, we can't have free will and so on. I think that just we, we're bifurcate. We start out by assuming a bifurcation, and then then uh, uh, construct theories that somehow are supposed to bridge the gap from that of that bifurcation. Um, now, uh, so th there's a um, program. I, I watch it on the Australian ABC, but it, it must be American. Uh, a pen and teller fool me once. I don't know if any of your listeners have heard, have seen this program on TV, but the idea is a magician comes on. It's filmed and it's it's performed in Las Vegas. Um, in any case, a magician comes on and performs a trick, and pen and teller try to figure out how the trick was performed. And I was just killing time last night and I watched part of one episode and the woman came on and performed a particular trick and then she said okay it was a mind reading trick you know how I perform this and um teller is teller the one that talks I can't remember one of them talks and is the one that does. talks <laughs> Ten talks Ten said exactly what Wittgenstein says when magi good magicians it's the move that you think was the innocent move that you don't pay any attention to. That's when the rabbit was put in the hat. That's when the big move was made. Um, and I think that's, that is the story of recent work in metaphysics and philosophy of mind. It's the innocent move, the assumptions that everybody accepts that are the things that need to be called into question. And many of these assumptions start with bifurcations by dichotomizing things. So we've got the mental and the physical, we've got phenomenal, uh, we've got qual qualia, mental qualities, and then physical qualities. And we just start off by making those assumptions and they're just obviously different. And at that point, the rabbit's already in the hat. We've put the rabbit in the hat as uh, Wittgenstein would have said. Do you think a lot of these assumptions were, it's really the, <laughs> inspired from the work that Descartes did. That's what laid the groundwork for a lot of the assumptions we make about um, the conceptual distinctions between mind and 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 extended stuff. 
Right, right. So, um, yeah, so Descartes, uh, Descartes was convinced that the mind-body distinction was the technical sense, a real distinction. That is, minds could exist um, independently of bodies and bodies independently of minds, and each could exist on its own. So God could create a universe with just extended bodies. God could create a universe just with minds. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm, I think a lot of this does go back to Descartes. Um, but, you know, if you look at the history of philosophy, it's, it's kind of cyclical. Um, we redis- we're constantly rediscovering our past and um, reevaluating it or recasting it, reframing um, things from the past. And uh, so Descartes probably not exclusively to blame here see because spinoza who you know overlaps with descartes um his view was that mental physical distinction is not a real distinction it's a distinction of reason to reason and um it was just two different ways of looking at the same thing one uh and that they're they differ metaphysically in that descartes is thinking that a substance can have only a single attribute and all of its properties are just ways of having that attribute. So a a physical thing was something that had the attribute of extension and all of its properties were just ways in which it was extended, you know, in the, in the spherical way or whatever. And uh, mental things, all of its, uh, its, um, its, um, uh, attribute was thinking, and so all mental properties are all ways of thinking, by which he meant being conscious or something like that. Um, and uh, Descartes comes along and says, I mean, sorry, Spinoza comes along and says, no, um, the, uh, the mental physical distinction is one of reason to reason. There are two attributes, but they're attributes of the same thing. There are two ways of considering one and the same thing. Uh, and he's, a, he, you know, he's playing, he's at the same time as Descartes. But for some reason, um, Descartes seems to have, have had more influence in this regard. Nobody seems to have paid attention to this aspect of Spinoza. They worry all about the, you know, monism and all that stuff. But Descartes was probably a monist about extended substance. He probably thought, he, he seems to have thought there was only one of them. Um, and it, uh, so that a tomato was just a way that the extended subject, uh, a local way of the extended substance being extended. That's, this is controversial, but our, there are, I've talked to Descartes scholars um, who have said, yes, this is, a pl- this is one plausible way of reading Descartes. It's the way Keith Campbell had read Descartes, by the way. Right. And this, this sort of monism that you were talking about earlier is something that you find somewhat plausible. Um, is that a kind of priority monism? Like there is just this... this one thing or that's um in in a sense fundamental and there's different ways of talking about it um or different like modes or attributes that it can have well the i mean the term priority monism comes from uh schaffer i think and i think he's just confused about spinoza because his idea is if you're a prior priority monist the whole is prior to the parts. Somehow the, the parts depend on the whole. And uh, that is not Spinoza. Um, Spinoza, the whole doesn't have any parts, <laughs> has zero parts. But, but um, Schaffer is calling its parts or its modes, way, modification, local modifications of it. They're not parts of it. They don't add up to it in, in, a, in any sense. So, they depend on it 
just in the way any mode, any um, modification of something depends on the something. So you can't, the, a dent in your car door, you need the door to have the dent, right? But the, the, it's not as though the door is made up of dents and non-dents put together in a particular way, and yet somehow they're dependent on it. They're not parts of the door. They're modifications of the door. And this is the way Kant thought about properties, and it's the way Spinoza thought about the properties, Leibniz, Kant, many, many other people thought about properties in this way, and somehow it got lost um, between the, between Kant, really, and the 20th century, when universals came back into vogue. Uh, none of these guys were fans of universals. Well, so then we might maybe more of a, like an existence monism, like there's one there's one thing. Yes. Right. 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 Um, That's what you get in Lewis. That's what you get in Lewis. So you've got space time qualities. Qualities are modifications. You could think of them as qualitative modifications of space time, let's say. It's one way of thinking about the, um, the Humean mosaic, right? That's the, the qualities in no way, shape, or form are parts of it. They are, they're, they're not, um, you know, grains, you know, you put together uh, that make it up. That's, that's the wrong way. I mean, you know, he says um, there are qualities that, uh, you know, could be qualities of space time. Uh, or of, he might just say of space at that point, but he's, he is a four dimensionalist. So. so at times, I think in your work, you've suggested that um, there isn't a correct way to sort of carve up the world um, that, uh, you know, that the world doesn't come to us with joints ready to be cut or whatever. <laughs> um, but we, we cut it in different ways. And there's not like one of those ways is right or, or more right than the others in principle. Um, is this, is this, first of all, I guess, is this a view you still hold? And second, if so, then what is it to um, sort of arbitrate the dispute between someone who thinks that, ah, they're really just this one thing, the universe or you know space time or whatever it is, um, and someone who thinks that, um, no, I can talk about it as a, just a collection of particulars or um, there's just different ways to talk about it that don't commit me to that thing being the one thing. Right. So, so, so I, think of, I think when you're doing metaphysics, you don't want to come up with a theory that constrains sciences and in particular that, that constrains physics. Many people in talking about the special composition question, all these kinds of questions, seem to take on board some form of atomism, right? But suppose the world were continuous, you know? What, are they, what, do, you, what do you say then about the special composition question for just to take one um, example? And what I want is a metaphysics that can handle whatever physics throws at it. And so if physics, if physics throws at it monism, that what you have is space time and, you know, it's filled up with fields and what we think of as individual particles are in fact kind of abstractions. They're not little pieces of matter that move around um, and interact with one another. I want my metaphysics to be, um, to comport with that kind of a position. It also, it, you know, if the world, if the universe turned out to be Aristotelian, I want it to comport with that as well. If it, it, uh, this is how, this is, uh, to my mind, this is how you should do metaphysics. And so I don't, it's not that I'm um, pushing for monism. I'm saying that, well, you know, when you look at physics, monism does seem to have a lot going for it, but that we, you should be able to, you know, have a cosmology that, you know, can can deal with either of these two, you know, lots of little things or only one big thing, uh, either of those views. I want my metaphysics to comport with either one of those. It's just that, you know, when you look at physics, 
a, the tide seems to be turning away from the, you know, the standard theory and towards something that looks more like, you know, some kind of monism. But again, I don't, that's, I don't think you can establish that philosophically. Um, I don't right. Think you, so that you can sort that out in the pub or the seminar room. Right. Right. So the idea is that, well, we have um, a sort of uh, physical enterprise, and we want yeah. our metaphysics to be consistent with whatever, um, however physics goes. And it seems like it might go, or there's a decent sense that it might go in a way that is amenable most to this existence monism view. But I mean, if it turned out that um, it wasn't that way, then um, well, we wouldn't needn't be existence monists, I guess. Um, right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. I'm not. I'm not giving an a priori argument, or you know, an, an a posteriori argument, or some sort of a combination argument for monism. Uh, what I what I have been doing is saying. This is a natural reading of um, Lewis and, and you know tying it in with Spinoza and so on. And you know, there's uh, this does seem to fit with a lot of things that physics says. But again, at the end of the day, we could if we you know that it that could be completely wrong. I mean, that you know, as far as anyone knows, uh, things could be quite different. There could be lots of little pieces of matter moving around and maybe little souls moving with them or whatever i you know i don't th that's that's uh uh that's not for philosophers to to decide right i guess a, a concern someone might have is that look the way our physics goes right and the um uh the sort of descriptions that we're committed to in our best scientific theories are in some way contingent. It didn't have to be that sort of way. And you could have imagined a, uh, I mean, there could be a completely adequate physics um, that uses different sorts of descriptions. And on that sort of other physics, um, maybe we wouldn't be committed to uh, any sort of existence monism. Whereas on this one, on the actual physics we have, we are so. I, I, I guess I'm the concern is sort of an undetermination one or something like that. But it, but it might have just be that. Um, the physics could lead to different metaphysical pictures depending on which physics we take, and so why take so seriously the actual physics we have in this metaphysical theorizing? Is that if that makes any sense? No, I mean so to my mind, metaphysics has to you know, take, take what is available. And this is, this happens to be what's available. Um, uh, you know, b these are, these are available uh, positions that seem to, you know, this kind of Aristotelian position on the one hand, which seems to work really, really well. Uh, but then, uh, you know, when you then turn to quantum physics and general relativity and so on, that it starts to look iffy and so on. So what we, I mean, metaphysics is evolves. Um, I mean, so here's one here's one thing to think, one way to think about it, Troy. That um, the uh, if you think of metaphysics as an a priori undertaking, and the fact that metaphysics is constantly changing, you know, people metaphysicians argue means that there's something fishy about metaphysics. I mean, mathematicians don't argue, right? I mean, if, once you do a proof, that's it. Don't argue about these things. Things that are le legitimate a priori uh, enterprises are not things that evolve or change. You get, you know, they, they grow and so on, but that's a different matter. Um, whereas metaphysics seems to evolve, and that's because you know, our information about the cosmos is evolving and metaphysics needs to take, an account, take into account new things that people hadn't thought of before coming into play. And um, the, uh, you know, physics 
uh, metaphysics inherits physics's um, fallibility. You know, any the right. any physical theory could always be false, and it seems to me that metaphysics is going to is in the same as the, in the same kettle of fish. For all I know, there's another. You know, I'm I'm casting I'm casting things as Aristotelian and Humean broad, with a broad brush, but there might be something, some other thing that I that no one's ever hasn't yet thought of, but will think of later on, or maybe we'll never think of. So, yeah. Yeah, f fair enough. I mean, I guess the concern isn't that you know the current physics might be false and that might undermine our metaphysics that's on which it's based, but that there may be another sort of physics which is also adequate in describing the world. It, it could just be a different, we could carve up the world in a different way in a sort of physics-like theory. And if on that other physics, so to speak, um, we, uh, it leads us to different metaphysical conclusions, then the there isn't really a fact of the matter about which of those metaphysical conclusions is right or wrong. They're just sort of an outgrowth of different ways of carving up the world in our physical theories. Is that, does that make any sense? There could be a fact of the matter. I mean, the, the, um, I, I guess I'm skeptical that you really could have a completely unified uh, physical theories that were, you know, dramatically different in their, um, uh, Ontologies. Uh, I mean, I guess it's, that's a theoretical uh, possibility, but I'm not sure. But I, uh, even if even if that's true, even if there's that um, that uh, there's this ongoing problem of underdetermination, uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a fact of the matter. I mean, there that the um, uh, you know if there are these <laughs> If the two ways, if the the two ways of describing the thing truly are incompatible, then you know I I can't fit that together with um, underdetermination. But I will I I'll admit I hadn't thought about underdetermination until you brought it up. So that's that's that was that's a very interesting point. Yeah, I guess I mean it would have to be that the the physical theories you know, aren't uh, incompatible, right? Because obviously if one of them is yeah. an, an adequate description of the world, so is the other one. But then could it be that the sort of metaphysical conclusions that we draw from those uh, or develop based on those theories are incompatible? I'm not, I'm not sure. So um, no, I mean, what I would want to say is that if that your metaphysical uh, your the cosmology you develop in metaphysics should be able to accommodate both of them, um, and shouldn't you know a priori exclude either one or take sides. Uh, I mean, there the way you're um, casting it, there would be could be no empirical reason to take one side or the other in, in the physics, and the, I mean there there would be no reason for uh, meta uh, anybody in metaphysics to take sides either. I think you'd want something that, you know, well, if it's this way, then there's th then this is the case, and if it's this other way, then we have if it's if it's this way, we have a single substance that is like Spinoza's substance, and if it's this other way, we have pieces of matter interacting and or whatever they are, and and so on. Um, you, you you're Metaphysics should be able to handle those cases, it seems to me. So, I don't know. I'm yeah, all right. I mean, I guess there's a lot of issues for like going that. there, probably. So, I think I will move on. And we had another voice question from Chinichi. If you wanted to get on, you can ask your question. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hello. Okay, great. Um, so, I wanted to ask um, more online with the truth making stuff. Uh, and also in line with what you were, you've been talking about uh, quite a bit uh, tonight about sort of the Luisian picture, or I guess the Humean picture of the world. Um, there's that. There's this famous catchphrase about uh, truth supervening on uh, being, 
uh, on like the human <laughs> mosaic, so to speak. Um, now, I know you're a, a bit skeptical, um, and I should qualify that about like supervenience in general. So you think, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not describing your view right. You think that when people try to like, for instance, if I have a view of like weak supervenience and I say the truth of A supervenes on B is just the, or the truth maker, I should say, is just the uh, actual, this sort of uh, relation of uh, supervenience implicator, you're like, I think, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you're skeptical that such a thing uh, exists, or at least you want someone to cash out exactly what that's supposed to be. Um, so uh, given this, and I guess given your similar, I think, critiques of grounding, um, when would you agree with this sort of truth supervenes on being, and how would you cash out the supervenience talk that people often try to do with, with that statement? Yeah, so I definitely, I mean, so, I mean, Jaguan Kim eventually said this too, that when people have characterized supervenience, they've given these modal characterizations, but the, the question is, so where, what's, where's the beef here? What, what is the, you know, what, what, what is the metaphysics of these various things? You know, so we've got weak supervenience, we've got strong supervenience, global supervenience, we have all these, but, and these are given modal characterizations, but what the metaphysics is, is never um, spelled out. And uh, so to think of supervenience, I mean, when David's, so think about, so sometimes it's useful to think about how we got to where we are. But Davidson is the one that brought the supervenience talk into play. And Davidson was channeling Hare. And Hare was um, an anti, <laughs> I mean, Hare said, you know, um, the moral supervenes on the the moral the normative or moral supervenes on the natural. He certainly didn't have an, a metaphysical relation in mind in that case. Um, uh, he you know the what and so Davidson took him to mean something like well you can't have a moral difference unless you've got um, non moral difference. No, moral differences require non moral differences, and so if it, if two people it's true to describe A as good and B as bad. They have there has to be some non-moral difference between those, uh, between A and B, let's say. And Davidson just carried this over to um, the mental and the physical. So uh, if two people differ mentally, uh, they uh, uh, need to they must differ um, physically as well, and. Um, uh, uh, although you could have people that differ physically but don't differ mentally, okay. So the the supervenience is not a um, uh, is is not symmetrical in the way identity is. Uh, so truth supervenes on being. Yeah. So David David Armstrong says this. Lewis says this. Um, and the idea is that you know reality. I, I think reality calls the shot. At what makes something true? This is just this is just to invoke truth making. To say, look, if you want to, if you make a claim that purports to be about, you know, what is what is, then you owe us some account of what the truth makers might be. I mean, what the what the being that answers to these truths might be. I mean, certainly, Lewis uh, and talking about supervenience and talking about Humean supervenience, when he says everything supervenes on the Humean mosaic, is, not, is, is, is talking about, he, De, De, Lewis doesn't like to talk about truth making, but the easiest way to understand him, to understand that is truth making, that the Humean mosaic provides truth makers for all the truths that have them, all the truths that pertain to the cosmos. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if I that I can say more than that. I, I, I know I'm. I say more than uh, you want me to say. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Oh no, no, I, yeah. it's all it's all very helpful. Uh, I guess uh, kind of as a maybe short follow up. What what exactly is this um, like truth making relation supposed to be? I know that you're skeptical. I think um, of people having at least truth bears as propositions. Um, so could you say a little bit more about the specific relation 
that we're talking about when we talk about truth making? Uh, yeah. So the, um, I mean, I, I spent four years hanging around with Davidson. So I'm, um, uh, you know, in many ways, influenced in surprising ways by him. Pro ways that he would probably not want to own up to. But any, in any case, um, so what I've said. I don't know if I still want to say this in the past is truth making is an internal relation between a truth bearer, some kind, uh, you know, uh, something that um, is capable of being true and false and the way the cosmos is. Um, it's an internal relation such that if you've got the uh, truth bearer, a being what it is, you know, the truth bearer is something that says um, P, and you've got its being the case that P, you've got the uh, truth uh, bearer making true the, the uh, uh, sorry, the truth maker making the truth bearer true. So, um, and if you, if, so it's an internal relation in that sense, just like the um, taller than relation is internal. So if, um, a is, um, you know, if, uh, A is two meters tall and B is a meter and a half tall, then, uh, A is thereby, thereby taller than B. And that, that truth maker for that claim is just A, A's height and B's height. Um, that's all you need. There, that you, if you've got those heights, you've got, one being greater than the other. Um, so I've, I've always thought of truth making as that kind of an internal uh, relation. I mean, so I, I did publish a paper a long time ago, a little short paper attacking um, or criticizing uh, John Bigelow and David Armstrong. I was actually in Australia at the time. And um, or just uh, trying to characterize truth making as entailment. And my worry was that entailment is a relation, uh, you know, so A entails B just in case um, if A is true, B can't be false, right? But then you've got two truth bearers there. So, and truth making is a cross categorical relation between a truth bearer, something that has a truth value, and something that is not a truth bearer, that um, some state of the world, let's say. So, do truth bearers have to be simples, given some of the previous things we've no, discussed? No, I don't. I, I don't. No, I don't think. I don't think that has to be the case. It could be some very something very complex. So, think about. So, um, yeah. I don't think they have to be simple, no. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Oh, you're certainly welcome. Awesome. These are awesome and questions. I, I think you've, uh, speaking on like internal relations, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've given a similar account or, or sketched a similar account when it comes to causation as a sort of internal relation. Um, could you sort of elaborate on how that um, on what your preferred approach to causation is and how that works. Okay, so talking about causation, we're in an Aristotelian universe. And um, in that case, to me, the most plausible way of understanding causation is in terms of manifesting of powers. If you, if, um, if you think that somehow causation is a matter of things standing in relations owing to contingent laws of nature or something like that, then it's an external relation. But if you, if you think as I do of, of causation as the manifesting of powers, and it's part of the identity of a power that it will manifest itself in a particular way with a particular kind of manifestation par partner. And it's a, a it's part of the identity of that, the power of that manifestation partner that it will, you know, manifest itself in that way. And what that means is 
if you have those powers in the appropriate relationship, con contiguity or whatever it is, and you've got that manifestation. If you didn't have that manifestation, you wouldn't have those powers. If you take the if you take powers seriously, you explicate causation in terms of the manifesting of powers, and causation is going to turn out in a surprising way to be an internal relation. That is, if you've in this sense that if you've got the relata, you've got the relation. Um, you uh, it's just as internal as. If you if if you have the relata and you don't have the relation, you don't have the relata. I mean that because it's part of their it's part of their their um, identity conditions that they manifest themselves in these ways. So if you don't get these manifestations, you don't have these manifestation partners. So that's how I thought about causation as internal. Yeah, interesting. And do you think that? Um... Presumably, you don't think that all uh, relation talk can be reduced to internal relations, right? Or do you think there's some any prospects for that sort of approach? No, I think relation talk can't be um, reduced to uh, all, you know, relational talk can be reduced to internal relations. So spatial locations and so on. So something is, you know, 20 feet from something else that looks like an external relation. I do think, though, that the truth maker for it for that uh, claim could be, you know, uh, turn out to be not analytically derivable, but um, turn out to be something that is not, does not involve ex external relations. So I got this from Campbell too. Um, right. Although he doesn't put it quite this way. Um, it, it's a, a kind of a consequence of what, of his, um, the way he's thinking about um, space and special relations. All right, I, and I had another question about something that's sort of come up already, but not too much, not not very much. So um, you've talked about like reality is the, the sort of views on which reality comes in levels, or there's a sort of hierarchy and. and things in one level might not be reducible in some way to the things in the other levels that, that this is that they have some sort of independent being and, and I think I take it you've been very critical of these sorts of views um, I guess could you comment on on uh, why you are critical of these views and um, and then I guess I'll follow up with a, a sort of a sense in which we might talk about hierarchy or different levels um, that may be less controversial Uh, right. Well, I to, are. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, in my view, the levels talk comes from linguisticized metaphysics. So, we it is you cannot reduce biology to chemistry in the following sense. You can't deduce biological categories from or extract biological categories from chemical categories or pure categories that you that rise in physics and so on so we have we have no reduction there i take reduction to be a, a kind of not not a metaphysical relationship you can't reduce something to something else i mean how would that work but rather a kind of epistemological derivational relationship in any case what you have uh, uh, is a reading off of these um, facts about reducibility uh, or analyzability or whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it, uh, as a, a meta metaphysical level. So that these, because I can't reduce biological talk to chemical talk, let's say, or psychological talk to biological talk. And uh, uh, biology must, you know, the, must have be uh, deal with uh, entities at a higher level. And what I want to say is, no, we're dealing with 
everybody's dealing with the same entities, but just in different ways. And these ways can be orthogonal. The, ca the taxon taxonomies that you get in biology are orthogonal to taxonomies you get in um, psychology or, or orthogonal to tax taxonomies you get in physics. But that doesn't mean that they aren't all uh, the what the truth makers for claims made using those taxonomies aren't one and the same thing. You know, uh, that's that's how I think about levels. And let's face it, um, if you think of levels as having as being heavy duty metaphysical um, structures, then um, you've got all kinds of problems about. Now, how do the higher level things not get in the way of the lower level things? And, uh, you know, how does how do we get how do we you know, the mental causation. Literature is. You know, take starts takes this on board to begin with and then runs with it. And in my mind, that's just gratuitous. There's no reason to think that irreducibility implies metaphysical distinctness. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one thing to say that our, like our concept or our language or whatever, are reducible, which is typically not the case in the in sense, but the things that we're talking about, um, like if all we mean by this, like X is reducible to Y is that, you know, the things in the world described, um, by the term X or the, the language X, whatever, can also be described in the language of why. And that's a sense of reduction, which you in general wouldn't um, contest, right? Right, just, right. I just, right. I think that it, it's, it is, um, it would be misleading and a red flag to describe it as reduction, but yeah, I mean, and if, if that's, if that's what someone means by reduction, then I don't have, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember this. There was this uh, quote that you included in, in one of your papers or something where uh, um, it's as if like like God was instructing, uh, you know, the angels uh, to to make the world. And uh, he gives, uh, you know, a bunch of them the, the different tasks of, you know, making the, the facts of psychology and, you know, meteorology and geology and all these other things. And then he, he then he gives to another one like, uh, "I'll here construct all the the laws of physics and so forth, but don't get in the way of all the other all the other angels." Yeah, right, <laughs> right. It seems. Are you sure that was me? Maybe it was me. I don't know. That it that, wasn't. That, it's not yeah. your. It's not uh, something you wrote, but it's a, it's a quote that was included in one of your papers. I, I, I can't remember which one. Yeah. It was okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe so, at least. Uh, um, and I find that yeah, that kind of comes to intuition about what's going on here, I think. Um, yeah. So let's see. You've written, uh, forgive me, but I'm going to bring up something that you wrote on a long time ago. <laughs> um, but y you've written a few papers here and there on the issues of skepticism, um, and including one in response to uh, Hillary Putnam's argument against the a sort of skepticism, the uh, like Brain and Vat style skepticism. I know this is from like 1985. Do you do you have any recollection of this? Uh... <laughs> um, so um, you know, I I um, two years at Berkeley and then two other non contiguous years at Berkeley, and um, I was. At one time, skepticism at Berkeley was an industry. So one term I remember, there were three seminars on skepticism, one taught by Barry Stroud and maybe maybe with the help of Thompson Clark, who is this able guy who um, uh, left philosophy, but was still very much a present. Um, so there was Barry's seminar on skepticism, uh, Benson Mates, was doing one that was more historically oriented, and Wally Matson was doing one on skepticism. So we had three seminars on skepticism. So I imbibed 
the wine of skepticism and under those circumstances. Although I was never, Barry never uh, convinced me. Uh, I didn't get, so um, yeah. The brain in the vat, I don't remember the line that I took on that. Yeah, roughly, um, well, you gave, you gave like two sort of interpretations of the argument. One on which the argument was just like clearly circular um, or question begging. And then the other on which, um, look, if we, there's, there's two possibilities. We are um, speaking English. And then when we say that we're a brain in a vat, um, we say something uh. necessarily false or we're speaking quote unquote vat English. In which case, when we say that we're um, a brain in a vat, um, we're not saying really anything yeah, but, right. like what we're saying. <laughs> we're saying something yeah. about an image of a brain in a vat, um, and um, and and so the argument. Um, you make some interesting points about how okay, but that's this is just a point about you know the sort of things that we can say given the sort of circumstances that we're in, but it doesn't really decide what really is the case independent of what we can say. Um, right. So it's a, it is a criticism. To, I, I'm vaguely remembering this. So if you are not in a vat, then it's, when you say I'm a brain in a vat, it's false. And if you are in a vat, for different reasons, when you say I'm a brain in a vat, it's false because you're not speaking English, you're speaking bad English, right? So either way, it's false. So let's just to say that Putnam's argument is not, uh, I was not a fan of Putnam's argument. I'm sure I wrote that uh after uh this came up in one of those berkeley seminars yeah what i was gonna uh question about though in relation to this is that in other places i think you've been critical of um like externalism about about content and stuff like that um mm -hmm. and i wonder if that uh, that's correct like that's a, a view you um would would defend now um and whether uh, that might be another response sort of in favor of the skeptic against Putnam that, look, the external features don't make a difference. I can speak, quote unquote, English in both cases, um, since the internal features are the same, the content would be the same. Yeah, right. So my argument only works if you take um, Putnam's assumptions on board. If you, if you take the kind of position that I was talking about an intentionality um, uh, where it's, it isn't um, externalistic, you don't give an externalistic account, then, um, you know, then that, that particular argument doesn't work. But again, I was just taking, given Putnam's assumptions, it doesn't work. But, and at that time, no. I, I, I was, I had no views about intentionality. I mean, Searle was go was prancing around, you know, saying over and <laughs> over, talking about the intentional stance and all that stuff, and or not the intentional stance. That would not that would be Dennett, but the you know he was, and uh, I just didn't. I was pretty sure that I didn't agree with Searle, but I didn't have any well formed thoughts about about it. I was just taking on board, for the sake of argument, Putnam stuff. Yeah, and, and and Cyril famously has been uh, was a, a, a prominent internalist, right? Uh, and yeah, although it's things. really what his view is is quite mysterious. I think so. It's you know caused by and realized in. I mean, you know, there was a lot. There was always <laughs> a lot of hand waving with Cyril. I mean, the problem was Cyril was so good on his feet and so um, you know kind of uh, persuasive in a debating context that, you know, the, the flaws in his view were difficult to um, appreciate. You could feel uneasy without knowing exactly what, what was bothering you. What, you know, you couldn't put your finger on where he was pulling a fast one, I think. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm inclined to agree. I, got, I like a lot of his, um, what he's had to say philosophically, but some things seem, even if at first blush that seemed plausible, it's 
it's problematic when you investigate further, especially some of his views on on mind. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Sort of non-reductive view that it's hard to make sense of <laughs> or get it, understand exactly what he's saying sometimes. But I still right, so found him a great I, philosopher. I'm sitting, uh, I'm sitting in my, I, while I'm talking, I'm sitting in my office looking at a picture I have on the wall of J.L. Austin, um, who whom I read as a graduate student and made a huge impression on me at the time, but was not a lasting impression. But I honor him for sort of awakening me to various things. And of course, Searle was an Austin student and I think spent his life trying to get out from under the shadow, wanted to distance himself, distinguish himself from Austin. So, um, you know, not to psychoanalyze Searle, which would be a hopeless task, but uh, I think that accounts for some of the things that Searle says that um, don't exactly add up. Now, I should I should let you and any of your audience that's still around escape. Uh, I can't believe I've wasted so much of so many people's time. <laughs> I was gonna, I was going to actually wrap it up in a couple of minutes, but no, it's not a waste at all. It's been it's been a, a wonderful. Um, I, I think a lot of myself, especially, have really enjoyed um, hearing your responses to a lot of our questions. It's been great. Um, but yeah, if you don't mind, we can we can wrap it up there. Unless someone has a burning uh, question that will prevent sleep tonight, um. <laughs> I think I think we're good. Um, yes, yeah, so it's been over two hours, so yeah. So thanks so much for. For staying that long and i hope it hasn't been a bother to you <laughs> not at all it was my pleasure but you know philosophers love to talk about their own views. it's just that i've had these major kind of paradigm shifts that over the past uh, four years that um have excited me so um and i hope that they're they i hope that other people will respond to them in a good way <laughs> as well. Not necessarily agreeing with me, but at least sort of getting on board with the, pro with the program. So thank you so much to all of you. <laughs>